Welcome, everybody. This is the SEO Vault. My name is Mike, your host today. I'm joined by Mark and Nate. Welcome, everybody. We are uh, here today to talk about the latest SEO trends, news, and much more. Just a quick reminder, too, if you're looking for uh, campaign review suggestions on your SEO campaigns, head over to web20ranker.com. We do have free campaign reviews, um, so go check that out. In this episode, we're going to be going over uh, the news. We have some updates, brand updates. Uh, going to be talking about some fun AI stuff, so definitely stay tuned. And remember, if you missed any past episodes, uh, you can check us out on all your favorite podcasting platforms. So go find us there, like, share, leave a review, all that good stuff for us. So uh, yeah, th- thanks, Mark, Nate, for joining me on this beautiful day. Hello there, Mike. Thank you for having us on our podcast. It's... <laughs> you're, Thank you're you welcome. for the warm for the warm welcome. Um, <laughs> I'd like to welcome you as well as you welcomed us. Um, no, seriously, Yo. huge huge shout out to the Web Twenty team. Uh, I know I just made a post today on Facebook. We have uh, hopefully a video dropping in October, more of like a state of Web Twenty. And all the work the team's done, and like I really want to give a huge hat nod. Just co- complete workhorses over there, kicking ass, and everyone over there is so invested in the community success and the success of the campaigns. And it's just such an impressive uh, team, and you know, so definitely get those recommendations. Everything's been improved from a qualitative perspective, and we'll have more details on that coming soon. So. Yeah, big shout out to the Web20 team. They've been amazing to work with these past however many months it's been. Time isn't real anymore. <laughs> it all just blends. But no, amazing work. Uh, you, you too, Mike, just completely crushing it. Lots of cool stuff in the pipeline to be announced. And yeah, here we are. Definitely, man. The teams, like everyone came together. Really, really been and stuff you know lasha and sierra losa just the new new review process onboarding process um addressing real issues in the campaign like awesome exciting stuff so thank you mark but uh, the team really are the ones rocking it out for us as much as i would love to give all the credit (laughs) oh no that wasn't my intention for sure to give you too much mike you'll (laughs) you'll be a a little just a little bit. Your, your ego goes crazy. We're all in trouble, my friend. I'm, I'm just kidding. You, you've all been amazing. Um, man, lots of lots of cool stuff to go over today. Um, yeah, with I mean, along with all the the stuff you just mentioned, Mark, we got a lot of stuff in the works for the SEO dashboard. Uh, doing some major updates. I don't, we don't have any solid timeline on that, but I know we're probably looking to t- start testing over the next couple of months. Uh, we have an internal content tool that we're we're using and actively developing, and we're getting to the point now where we're looking at letting some people come in publicly and start using this, you know, themselves as well. So that's super exciting. And then even the the Linda AI bot chat bot Nate was going over on the uh, the last episode. You can go check that out if you didn't see that. But there's going to be more news coming out on that soon as well, unless Nate has something to add. That is uh, nothing additional, Mike. Something okay. will be coming soon, probably next week, maybe the week after. But uh, lots of good insight coming from some of our initial beta testers and just really excited about that world, which almost plays into today's world a bit too with uh, the AI content theme. Um, but happy to uh, happy to jump into that here in a bit. Yeah, no, I mean, we could just segue right from that, too. I mean, we're talking about content and and helpful content, which also ties into, like, a chatbot, right, which uh, Google has launched the helpful content update. I think it officially finished rolling out today, like this morning or something like that. Um, so that's – I've definitely seen some people getting hit pretty heavy from it, and then, you know, also the, the people that just don't really see like, a problem. Hard to tell if they don't see a problem or if they're not really doing that much SEO, though. To be honest, <laughs> I hate to say that, but like in local versus like an affiliate site, you'll see like these updates and some people really get hit and things like that. So it's uh, 
I've heard a lot of theories. Do you guys have any any input on what you think Google's really trying to target when it comes to helpful content? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's the age old like. Sorry, I didn't want to be rude and jump in if Nate had something ready to go. I, I think it's what they've always been trying to go after, where, you know, the vehicle's always going to be blamed. Oh, it's AI content today. It was spun content another time. It's the quality of your writing shop another time. It, at the end of the day, if you're building content specifically for bots, not to say it's not going to work either, but that's always going to be probably higher on the chopping block of content that's going to be negatively affected by updates like this. Um, it also has a huge impact, like you mentioned, between like national and local. Now, during the last tumultuous update, a lot of the local stuff, we didn't see a ton of volatility, and the national stuff was way different. Um, I mean, un unless you listen to the best SEOs out there who only ever increase rankings during updates, I see those uh, those posts get made. They're just not always can be that quite that fancy, but you know, there there definitely seemed to be a lot of volatility on the in the national SERPs as opposed to local. Local always says its own collection of, of challenges, doesn't it? But you know, there's still. I, I just saw um, someone run a case study on a whole complete AI site popped up in a couple months. I think it was two months, quote, like quarter million words within those two months on an expired domain. Looks like a, I, I think I showed both of you guys. I don't know if you saw it before that, but it, I was joking with Nate and I was like, if we got this as a link, if our team came back and was like, hey, we got a guest post here, we'd reject it. And that site's doing like 50 plus thousand a month and but yet i mean it's it's doing really well and it has a lot of top like pop culture rankings for celebrity sightings and stuff i mean it's just dominating like it's like fresh content right um dominating a lot of fresh content serps and you know at, at the end of the day there's always gonna it seems like it's like the same old story a little bit a little bit different of a tune Google's out to supposedly try to make their stuff better. They're they're trying to create boogeymen, saying links have been deprecated in their algorithm so much, which I I do I do believe that's something. If you do any amount of SEO and you're willing to look through an unbiased perspective, I think that's something a lot of people can agree on, right? Links have definitely become weighed a, a lot less over time, but. You know, they're not even in the top three. It's like, <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it. Let's talk about this helpful content update that uh, I hear is not been hitting these recipe sites, which I know a lot of people hate because that content apparently is very helpful. Um, <laughs> but I honestly haven't seen much with the, the content update. Uh, I don't have many like affiliate sites or big sites like software companies or anything um where i think i've seen more people get hit when they have like national sites or maybe very heavy local blogs have you seen anything like that in particular of hearing what people are saying maybe he's getting hit or not i definitely have seen unless you're like the best seos in the industry that every update all they do is have rankings go up 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 <laughs> We see a few of those posts every every Google update for normal mortals like us, for mere mortals. Um, definitely saw local was pretty cush. I, I don't I don't remember seeing a whole lot of volatility in local um, national rankings. There's definitely some mix mix ups, some pretty drastic mix ups. Um, you know, I was it was like I was telling you guys earlier. Like Google's always always gonna be looking to try to you know well, I would say SEOs are always trying to blame a vehicle or overanalyze a vehicle. Google's always just trying to solve a problem. You know, people would say, Oh, it's spun content and then you had the the birth of super spinning. Do you guys remember that? Like the <laughs> manual spun to produce the best quality and then you know, honestly there was another there was another strategy. Um, it wasn't using AI, but it was, and it wasn't spun, but it was like taking chunks of content. It would scrape a bunch of 
relevant content based on a keyword and it would chunk it and start layering it together. There was, you know, people talking about your writing team quality and, you know, there's, there's always the vehicle that SEOs are looking at and wanting to, to point at on why their sites are not ranking or getting hit. And at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it's all, it's all a quality thing. Um, there's some beautiful stuff being made with AI. Um, you know, it's, I, I'm not sure that's the thing. And, you know, I was telling you guys about that site earlier that was case studied where they bought a, an expired domain, dumped like a quarter million words of content on it in like two months. It site looks like complete shit. Like we wouldn't place links on it. If our team came back, we would deny it just by how the site looks for a guest post. We wouldn't build links on it. And they're doing, you know, 50 plus thousand a month within two months. All AI yeah, generated looks like garbage, like everything that's not supposed to work. <clears throat> and then it's tough to take Google 100% serious because they sensationalize everything they do. The backlinks not being top three, I thought was a, a pretty mm -hmm. funny thing they said. Definitely, you know, not the same impact that they used to have a decade ago for sure. But I mean, to, to act like they're not in your top three, you know, you'll get, you'll get some content purists to be like, nope, Mark's wrong. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not dying on the hill, but I always see a pretty great impact, a, a pretty measurable impact from link building. So another well, update, another, another bunch of speculation, you know, and say, if you're going to produce something of quality, you probably don't have to worry long-term. Well, like you said, that one site with the AI content was built on an expired domain and probably had a, a link profile of some kind, right? And I've seen, mm -hmm. like, I know if you fill up a, a website with content with no black backlink profile, you struggle. You struggle. Like, you can rank, especially locally, but, like, like if they would have did that same thing with AI on a brand new domain registered, no history or anything, they probably wouldn't have seen as good of a result at least from my experience, until I start doing, like, any type of backlink. Even when people say, well, I've ranked sites with no backlinks, and it's like, no, your client has backlinks before you got with them. You just didn't have to build more backlinks or direct backlinks to a page to rank it. But does that mean it's not an extremely important ranking factor for branding and authority and, and all that? So if anyone does, let us know in the comments or anywhere. If, if you have an example of a site that is ranking well with no backlinks, like a few citations or something may be fine, but like literally just no backlink profile and it's ranking for real terms. I've been wanting to see that, like to get a better understanding of what people are saying that they can rank with no backlinks. Um, because even if you have interlinks from the site with pages with backlinks, those are backlinks. They're just from your own website, essentially, right? So. Anyways, uh, I would love to see that. And more importantly, with the AI content part, I think it's interesting that people are even concerned that AI content would be targeted considering that Google and other search engines are specifically using AI to deliver answers and results to the user. And they're working in that direction, which means that AI content is obviously helpful enough that they're moving in the direction to use it to provide that information. So. Yeah, it, I definitely don't think it can be an AI thing or not. It has to do with, is it helpful? You know, does it help the user or not? And it'd be interesting to get a better idea of how they're kind of figuring that out, you know, on a technical side. But that's probably very complex. <laughs> I imagine there's some very smart engineers sitting around. And, and there could be a world... I know originally there was a, a study that had came, come out that was basically talking about the degradation in the next generation of these generative AI models if they're trained on their own output. So almost like uh, like human genetics, if you're making babies in too small of a gene pool, it's a bad idea. Uh, same thing with, with LLMs and future generations. So there, there could be a subset of internal engineers at Google that are trying to prevent their farm of human written content from being completely injected with nothing but LLM content. Um, 
I have to imagine there's some level of of at least worry or when you're at Google size and you see kind of the forecasting of so many people changing their behavior. And I think that the biggest change in behavior this year is people starting to use chat GPT. And like, I would say the majority, maybe not majority, but the SEO industry really has to be one of the main industries that's adopted chat GPT and LLMs in general. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is a group of Google engineers that are, are just worried, worried at their scale that like, if they don't solve that problem and it becomes a problem, it's kind of a, a pretty nasty world where it can snowball from them, where in maybe in six months you have X percent of your total SERPs are AI content, but then six months later, it could be some huge percent as more and more people get on. And if people are getting rewarded for lower amounts of effort, then they're going to want to go that direction more and produce more and more AI content. And then all of a sudden Google's golden goose is corrupted a bit. So uh, definitely could be some level of, of worry about all of us sitting around and generating AI content. But I think like everything we've seen, there's always that low hanging fruit of lazy people that just do the bare minimum and then Google can easily target them. And then the rest of the humans that are spending more time in this case, it would be, are you generating AI content and then immediately publishing it? Or are you using AI to kind of scaffold out your articles and speed up your process and then coming through and with a human touch, having some editorial step before you publish? Um, I, I imagine that between now and the next couple of months, as the gurus start to come out with their commentary, that that will be a, a common theme that we'll see. Yeah, we definitely see, I mean, we know AI content is mostly taken off, but even content that I know I've, I've written with AI, put on my site, has then been picked up by Google Bard or whatever, and use that information to deliver answers, which is kind of what you were saying over time, that could get can get really messy. And I, I guess there is some world then where Google's going to want to be able to identify what is AI or not. But I think more so that's probably where the helpful content update comes in because they can maybe try and filter that out from a usefulness level versus did AI generate this? Because, I mean, from my understanding, you can't really check that, right? Like it's I think the, 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 the going science right now is that you can't reliably determine if an LLM has generated content. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting world there. Is, is there a small group of really intelligent mathematicians that understand the theory? Could they possibly have something that could indicate whether or not content is AI generated in the next coming months? Sure. I can definitely see that. I mean, I know being very actively involved using LLMs basically every day, all day, like there definitely is patterns that you see coming out of, of open AI and you can prompt around them and, and you can use kind of iterative loops that send the prompt and the output back into each other and, and get it to improve itself. But there, there is signs of repetition when you get in, and you're generating enough AI content through either Claude or, or open AI. Um, so I don't know. It's an interesting world thinking about how much the internal teams at Google or anybody will be able to identify AI content. And then on top of that, how much they want to tell us about what they can or can't do in terms of their identification capabilities. So, I don't know. We're always playing in this world of Google where on one hand, they do say things that should be helpful for webmasters and digital marketing companies. But on the other hand, as we all know, part of their role is, is misinformation and disinformation. And then you have this layer of people that just love taking what Google says and going and evangelizing it to everyone on the internet as if they've actually tested it or have any experience outside of answering weird people on the Google support forums. So it's, it'll, it'll be an interesting 
couple of months next year here in the SEO sphere. Interesting that you mentioned. I think, oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think another thing to always consider when anyone thinks about SEO, and this has helped me sleep a lot of nights as we test a different, different methodology, is like Nate mentioned, you know, when, when those smart people, and, and there's already tools trying to, to, you know, determine if something's AI or not. And then there's the hilarious thing where they said AI wrote the Bible and, you know, all types of false positives with anything in that space, um, AI and, and, and even ML, there's going to be like a confidence level, right? So if even, let's say Google can get an engineer to like a 90% confidence level, which is huge over the trillions of sites they have, what is it, 50, 60, 100 trillion uh, websites or, or, you know, documents indexed, like, there's still, if they would make a Boolean decision, like, if it's true that we have this 90% confidence level that the content is AI-generated, whack them. Like, the, you're not, you're just not going to see stuff like that usually in that widespread, like, if this, then that, just definitive response. Will they look to devalue? Sure, probably in the same way if you have your, you know, your your first grader write all your blog posts, you know, and they're like, wow, this content is terrible grammar. It's it's terrible. Like I would see a de the devaluation work probably in the same way, not the same algorithm for that, but they want to devalue that type of content and, and de-index it and stuff like that. So, you know, not to say that they won't crack the code on it. I mean, these companies hire the, the literally the smartest humans on the planet to think about really hard problems every day. But usually when you, you know, someone's saying, Hey, if this occurs, then that's going to be the negative reaction every time is usually a terrible way to look at how Google would handle the integrity of the results that drive the views that drive all of their revenue. Like that's scary. I'm, Nate's a phenomenal engineer and I'm in that position. If I was like, Hey Nate, I'm going to come to you with some crazy idea. Hey Mark, what's new? It's like, I want to devalue all of this or get rid of this out of our index based on this. Like we would sit and be like, man, what are all the French cases that, you know, in a small, in a small group, who cares when you're talking about literally the, the, internet. the monopoly on search. Yeah. I mean, those French cases could slaughter, could create a, a hell storm tank stock price. Like, they're going to be somewhat careful with those Boolean, those Boolean rules that just tank stuff. And, you know, we do see the penguins. We saw this last just terrible update. It, it, they happen. All the shit they did in local, where there, what was it? Three quarters of a million businesses killed with their, when they did the match, they were, they were doing the ML testing. If they took all those spam listings and matched them. Um, we saw what they did to disenfranchise businesses in Africa when they they nuked that entire uh, browser's <laughs> partnership program, killed all these poor people's business sites. Like, like Google will <laughs> Google will crush you, but they're gonna try not. Like, you know what I mean? They're when you think about it in the span of your career doing this, how many times have you seen that sword swung where it's like everyone's like truly justifiably crushed. I'm thinking mm -hmm. Penguin. This last update was bad. It wasn't Penguin bad. It wasn't Penguin bad, like, in my opinion. I don't remember <laughs> uh, anything as bad. Penguin upended. <laughs> penguin turned SEO Industries <laughs> penguin changed upside the industry. down yeah. overnight and it wiped out 80% of, like, that was <laughs> insane. Of the millions of right. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's like you don't see those often mm -hmm. where every everyone, there's a lot of sensationalism. There's a lot of these SEO blogs that are, yeah, I hate to say this, but they, they thrive off clicks. They thrive off the SEO news. It's how they make their living. They say, I'm not, I'm not saying they're doing that in bad faith, by the way. I'm not, I'm not throwing that accusation, but like they need you to click. They need you to read. And the sky is always kind of falling, but until we have another penguin, oh, we're cool.
I'll be cool. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we definitely don't see those kind of updates as as much. And I think at this point, too, like you said, it, there's a lot more risk than like way back when Penguin and Panda came out. That was, was that like ten years ago now. When was that? 2012, right? Yeah. Am I right about 11 yeah. years? Was it 12? Well, I mean, I think it's 12. It's five, six, six. Might wow, have been a little before that, yeah. So that's the, the point. Well, I think though. 2.0 was 12, right? I think Penguin was 2.0, yeah. the real bad one. Holy shit, I my memory. I swear fried. it was like an 09 or 10 or something. Because I was young. Like, mm. I remember being pretty young Penguin? in the industry. Yeah, the very first Penguin update. I guess we could Google it real quick. <laughs> but I, I do remember. I, was, lie, uh, I ain't going to lie. It was that update that made me go time to get into SEO. Because I immediately saw that there was like a level playing field. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity with those updates. And that's where I think a lot of SEO, like Mark said, blogs and, you know, the people that want to get your attention in the SEO industry definitely thrive on those big scary things. Um, but it's it's going to be interesting with all the AI content. So speaking of AI content, we could talk a little more just about the uh, the internal content tool we've been working on and just how that how that even plays out with uh, yeah. you know current sure. space. Speaking so, of producing helpful content, you mean Mike? That exactly. So, <laughs> I, I think everything with that, it's, it's it's the qualitative thing. And there's two ways to look at it. One's efficacy of producing content where you can sit and chat GPT. The whole prompt thing and prompt engineering thing completely whacked people. In my opinion, first off, you see people doing cool stuff with that. Don't get me wrong. You see people doing really cool stuff with it. I think it also really spun people on how to best interact with an LLM and a prompt-based LLM like that. But having said that, there's the efficiency of generating the content and then the qualitative output. And something, you know, that was important for us is, like, if we can start to containerize what we need, um, a very specific piece of content where we're going to prompt that, we're going to create that in a very specific way, um, then we can start to have these little campaign modules, right? Or these little campaign pieces when it comes to your content where it's like, you know, this is how we can generate the best press releases. This is how we can do your your social descriptions, GBP posts, whatever you want, blog posts. And, you know, I think that's the philosophy that Nate, you know, had in mind when he started I mean, first off, the experience Nate has with uh, OpenAI right now is I mean, he's a humble dude, and he, he might not, you know, have said this himself, but that's why I wanted to jump in quick. It's like the the amount of hours he has in in the short period of time it's been out is probably paralleled by few, and the output he had is very impressive. I, I know if you guys check my Facebook post, I have it, um, the bodies building, um, I have it compared to Intercom's AI. And we, I just pulled another example accidentally the other night dealing with one of Inter, Intercom's AI bots. And I'm making a little folder, not to beat up on Intercom, what a behemoth of a company. But having said that, they do you know 200 plus million in revenue a year. And Nate, how Nate engineered his... AI bots and AI procedures to operate are are dwarfing these other companies who have a near infinite engineering and resource budget, and I think that's important. So I, you know, I just wanted to kind of gear it up where it's like a lot of the magic we're seeing, um, you know, is is taking the power of open AI outside of that chat instance. And into an engineering environment where someone competent like Nate is putting layers of engineering on top and saying, "Hey, why does this bot lie? We don't, or or why does the content lie? Why is it hallucinating? We don't want it to do that. Um, you know, how can I create better long form content experiences, or how can we containerize and segment by content type and produce the best results?" So Nate's here; he's the best guy to talk about it. But I know he's a pretty chill. 
West Coast humble dude, and he probably wouldn't have told you at this point. I mean, time moves quick, and Nate's only Nate's only one man, but what he's producing is very special in terms of his AI output, and you know, so we're we're leveraging that as much as we can internally, and letting a couple of people on the outside take a test drive as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Do we yeah. want to do we want to show? and tell mike or just continue to tell a bit um i mean we could show just a i guess a quick i mean maybe we hold off actually on showing it um we kind of just talk about it a little more because i think you can show the because everyone knows what an ai content tool is right there's like a million of them out right now and i think the biggest yeah. issue even like mark was saying is, is yeah you can have a chat you can have templates where you put in like all the information and click generate and get all your descriptions or whatever but there's this very like like uh the concept of like real use case right these are just ai content tools but like they have some content tools that'll you know better optimize for seo or like better optimize your blog post then also help write content but the big picture of an seo campaign isn't just that one blog post it's a content plan it's gmb posting it's the on-site it's sales page and you can kind of compartmentalize them and just overlay you know the gpt chat and just say this is for gmb descriptions but from a campaign level it really doesn't provide that solid use case it's just kind of oh you can generate all the content you know it's like the, we're the master at generating all the content whereas when when nate put this together it was very focused on local seo seo requirements uh and that's also why we're using it internally because it's it's essentially everything that we use content for where we need to get a an output where we can go through and then you know generate a quality blog post with the seo optimization and all that but do it for a full campaign, not just type in a blog post topic and then get a post, you know? Yep. I, I think this goes back to something we spoke about maybe two weeks ago now, Mike, with the AI chat bot, where as soon as you have a new technology, you're going to have a rush of entrance to the marketplace. And some of those entrants, a very minority amount, are going to be actually competent interesting companies that are doing something valuable, a very large amount of the entrants are going to be people that are just riding the wave that don't really have the deep industry experience that are just basically trying to capitalize on the hype. And just like I saw that immediately with the new AI chat bots that are coming out every day, where they're not mm -hmm. actually people that have any industry experience that have ever interacted with business owners that own websites uh, I think the same thing exists in this content, AI content space, where every tool that pops out really isn't baked in with in industry knowledge or useful use cases outside of what quickly becomes novelty once you're, you're playing around with them. And, and that is a big piece that we've been working on is, okay, how do we take this from this cool novelty technology to something that's actually going to be making meaningful and impactful changes in our business, either in reducing the amount of time that something needs to, to take, like content being published and edited and, and through the whole pipeline. But like what you're touching on right now is taking the underlying technology and saying, okay, how do we get it to generate an entire content plan and the content itself for mixed media, GBP posts, blog posts, press releases, all of these, these different types of content that are all kind of strung together with a common thread of voice, of tone, of goal, essentially. Um, and, and I think that's something that we are coming out the gates with and something that agencies are gonna find really useful in particular. Yeah, I mean, especially when you think about it, like when you get the like onboard a client, you get all that client's information, services, USPs, like all the things about the client, you use that information to structure 
their content, their blogs, everything within their campaign, the fact that a lot of these, the content tools have kind of just put in another a, a step to kind of, it's still broken apart, right? You still have to get that information, kind of put it in there, figure out where, when in reality, if you have all the required information about a business, with AI, you can you can essentially do all of that, you know, generate all of the content with just that basic intake form, right? Like if, yeah. if you generate a blog post, you need to come up with a, a high quality blog post concept to generate it. Then you already kind of cut off that whole campaign and you're trying to figure out what's a good blog post. But that's like arbitrary to the like not important at that point. Like you need to step back and look at the whole big picture. Yeah, 100 percent. Sorry, I was just going to say I, I wanted to, to hop back in. I think another huge benefit is, man, I, I don't know how some agencies do it. In um, Nate and I's one agency, we really obsessed over creating a content plan and filling it out. And not um, not a bunch of fluff either, but really going through and, you know, if if it's um, some type of a, 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 a service provider, a um, home service, we would look at the different uh, materials they install. And we'd make sure we have silos. And I'm actually going to pop a 100% uh, free training out. Our whole process, which was, uh, it's almost embarrassing to say now, but before we had, you know, some of the technology we have, it was a very manual, arduous process. It was, you know, a couple years in the making to really, to really have a system that clustered, scanned, stuff like that. And now... Um, you know, what was really beneficial was once we create that cluster and perform or those silos with the keyword clusters and perform a, a, a simple um, a simple bit of hygiene on them just to clean anything else up. Um, the ability to kind of bulk produce that content um, as opposed to having, you know, 120 pages that you need to go in prompt individually out of a, a chat GPT window is like, I mean, you're talking about, um, in that case, we're using this dope technology to create more manual labor. So the fact that, um, you know, we can throw a key in and with what Nate built, it'll go through and kind of create a queue and produce each piece of content. And then we can push that through the editorial process. And then, like, the content for the life of the campaign's done. And and as we need it, we can go in, we can optimize it, we can do the, the human editing, right? Whatever any agency's editorial process is, that's that's huge. And even these other smaller things with, um, you know, social posts or um, social descriptions or citation descriptions, press releases, whatever you're building, to be able to to be able to go in and say, hey, I'm an agency that's way different than Mark's and, and Nate's. I don't do anything like Mike. How do I benefit? It's like there's an entire at any point if we introduce a new content type into our agency or you to yours, you go in and there's an, a, a very flexible uh, content type configuration um, process, and you can go and configure it just as you wish to produce, you know, maybe a totally different piece of content. So I think that flexibility and the be able the the ability to kind of produce all of the, the shit you need for the month or in some cases maybe most of the campaign I think is so valuable. It just in something that just not long ago was such a tedious, very expensive hiring the writers and even now with a lot of AI tools, mm -hmm. it's a very predatory markup on credits. If you look at the if you look at the business of the AI tool right now, um they're basically throwing a very simple interface in place. Um, some are doing cool stuff. I'm not here just, mm -hmm. you know, generalizing and, and, and trashing an entire, you know, uh, um, space of tools now. But if you look at the how much a credit costs on OpenAI, and then you look at how much the credit costs there, it's like, it's almost, some of these are like predatory markups with what they're charging to create even a single article. And it's like, it, it's like this isn't what AI was supposed to do. AI was supposed to, am I right? I mean, it was supposed to kind of even, even the playing field and help everyone out. And and now it just it gave the 
you know, the, the group of people that can throw in a, a UI over something. It just gave them a, a predatory pricing opportunity. And, you know, so that that's another uh, issue I think we all had. And, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a couple things there. But I think they're all ex- super... Uh, which is just super critical for right now where we're at with the technology and shit and what we see other people doing in terms of capabilities and pricing and stuff. Yeah, the other issue is is all the different language models because like I could I could go on I can go make a, a content tool right now and sell it at the same exact credit cost as using chat GPT four, but then just use three point five or DaVinci and you'll just get garbage that doesn't really help you in any way. But if you put it side by side like other products, you look like you're getting a way better deal, which is there's so much mm-hmm. stuff that you people don't know. And it's it's kind of like playing this game of like, well, you got to literally make like a spreadsheet and map all these things out to know, is this really worth it? Or am I just getting like an overlay that, you know, I could pay chat GPT for and get this as good a functionality, you know? <laughs> hey, hey, chat GPT for... Please, please code me an interface to wrap your DaVinci, your DaVinci API so I can sell it to marketers. <laughs> we, I mean, we've seen that. We've seen big company. There's a couple of big companies in the space right now that did that. I'm not going to mention names, but like you, you can see them super cheap AI. And when you dig a little deeper, it's like, hmm, that is a, that is a off the shelf script. Yeah. To run DaVinci. Yeah. It's like, okay, cool, but DaVinci sucks. I mean, it pales in comparison to four. Four's dope. Yeah. Objectively, when, no matter how you feel about AI, if if you if you think GPT four is bad, like you you did something wrong. <laughs> you you prompted it. It's like it's so impressive considering what it is. You're writing a sentence in and getting a on output back. I mean, that's pre- that's pretty incredible. Um, at least for me, maybe maybe it's a generation thing. I remember you. You remember I, I found my my wife's old Game Boy when we moved, the original Game Boy, and I was like, "What? <laughs> yeah, the big." Dude, you and we turned it on. I was like, "I can't even see the screen." I was like, "What did we play?" So this is trash. I was like, "The lighting's garbage." I was like, "What the hell?" Maybe it's one of those things where people that grew up. Like, I grew up when the, you know what I mean, the internet boom was happening, like the AOL, AOL chat rooms and shit. So this, to me, is like, this is a second dot com era, right? This is like the internet all over again for, maybe for some people, they're just like, oh. Well, imagine like when the, calcul- the calculator was invented, that probably was a pretty big deal. To be able to, like, do math without having to use a little machine thing or whatever. I don't know much history. Like, there's big... Those big counting machines. Yeah, yeah what, like we had to. But I mean, that's that's like. What was the machine before the calculator? By hand with turning a wheel. The what? Yeah, they remember they had those big counting machines. They were you mm-hmm. like. The abacus or something and then like, or whatever it was. What was that called? I don't think the abacus, Mike. I think the abacus was from even an earlier time. Oh, it was. Yeah, that was like. Is the abacus like ancient Greek? Thanks. That might is that the abacus that old? No, that's something different. I just Mike might be right. Whoa, I might be right about history. Oh, don't don't do that. No, I mean seriously, I'm bad at history, history and geography. Like I literally probably learned geography because I got into local SEO. Like I, <laughs> it was the first time when I actually had to start paying attention to like locations and how like geographical things actually laid out and I was like, oh wow. I have a use for this now. Oh dude, yeah the abacus it is it does come from ancient. It's the you might know the kids toys that sit uh horizontally and you move the thing. Well this was similar to that. Mm-hmm. Like that's I guess that's a like modern day abacus. Look at that I watched a video once on how I to use it. It's pretty interesting. You guys are getting Dates to at least AD thirteen. I still use a sundial. <laughs> <laughs> I do really big maths in my head. Yeah. Not bragging or anything. No fuck. Mark doesn't need a graphing calculator. He's got a brain. 
Yeah, that's, that's why they don't let me do run any of the numbers in the businesses anymore. <laughs> I said I had to stop doing math in my head. So here we are. It's nice in the spreadsheets. You can do the formulas. It does all the shit for you. Boom. Um, but no, so seriously, though, like I, I thought it, I think it's it's pretty amazing. So I think it's important if you're going to plug into something and have it be part of your agency process, you should probably plug into the better models, the you know, that are, they're going to give you the output and look at that right back on track, <laughs> took a trip back to the, the middle ages to discuss the abacus, the, oof, right back on track. It's like a, it's like, it's like an art form, ladies and gentlemen, it's like an art form. There's a science, a science to this. <laughs> I think it is pretty awesome though. Like I, I mean, we was yeah. talking about this the other day on the call, just how much, like, even for me, how much my day-to-day -day work has changed using like, even if you don't use ChatGPT, like, in your agency, you should use it to start exploring, just answering questions, get, like, I can't think of the last time I needed to do something creative where I didn't pull ChatGPT in, even if I was on a call with, like, five people. Like, there's always that additional aspect that it can bring to the table that I, I think more people should explore if they, if they haven't yet, for sure. Definitely. It's like having a best friend and sidekick that's read the entire internet and remembers it all and yeah. can regurgitate it back to you. And like a real best friend, sometimes it fucks math up. But as long as you keep an eye on it, as long as you keep a little bit of an eye on it, you're like, hmm, are you messing with me, best friend? Like they party a little hard and they're hallucinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lying I don't know. to you. I never had any friends that did that, Mike. I want to know what that's about. I'm way str I'm I'm too straight edge for that, baby. Too straight edge. Um, but no, seriously, it is. It's um it it improved a lot of stuff and I feel like it's one of those things that people are still like totally against it. It almost is like that edgy you know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna like Taylor Swift. Everyone likes Taylor Swift. And it's like before you know it, maybe I'll listen to a little a little Swift. Maybe I'll maybe I'll throw in a little Tay Tay, and we'll make this happen. You know, like it's like uh, you guys ever listen to embarrassing music really loud in the car, and then when you pull up around people, you change the you change the song. Mm -hmm. No, you guys don't do that shit. Oh my god, you guys are. You guys are too cowardly to admit it. Okay, that's <laughs> fair, Mike. Dude, you don't ever do that. It's like, oh man, I can't have, I can't pull up to the function and have people people know Dude. that I was vibing like this the whole way. Here. I love people, like just having it's right in the black. Dancing in the car. No, that's weird. You don't, oh. you don't gotta make a weird one. Way, <laughs> way, way over the line. Way over the line. No, yeah, like for sure. I've I've listened to some pretty suspicious. It's like, oh wow, I'm actually, I accidentally have Madonna blaring. Time goes by, like that shit hits. Like I'll admit it, whatever. But then when you get around, it's like I better turn on. It's like what pop my young Jeezy back on to pull up to my friend group. We just listen to some popular hip hop guys, not Madonna. Any anywho, um, I think we can call it. Uh, I feel like that was valuable. A good, a good yeah, we're, we're starting to we're starting to go in a direction we'll never come back from. <laughs> um thank you thank you everyone definitely uh man definitely check out the the new email the new post about the um the the uh client had the filtering and address issue gave them the accelerated campaign working really hard to improve everything if you guys want to come ask some questions check out the new uh some of some of the new stuff some of the optimizations we did we're happy to talk about it and we'll have a formal video dropping in October, hopefully kind of going through just the last handful of months and the uh, the strides we've been able to make. And stay tuned for some of the other cool stuff we have. We're going to drop a, a local content um, video, how to build your local content plans, your content plans. And we're going to let a limited amount of people in for a um, content tool beta super price disruptive, no markup on credits, um, no limitations, no weird anything. Like we're gonna get we're gonna get funky with it, as the kids probably would say. It's some era, maybe not today. 
but stay tuned for a lot of cool stuff we have and um the local content I, I know sometimes content doesn't seem sexy but i'm pretty proud of the strategy we built it for the agency and i'll be sharing the whole thing start to finish from research clustering content production optimization the whole nine um the little tools we're using um the, the data hygiene we're doing some really easy easy ways to get it done and i'm i'm excited for all that so stay tuned and uh and um stay times stay tuned yeah stay tuned twice stay, stay tuned. tuned stay tuned stay freaking tuned guys and we'll see you next <laughs> week then thanks nate mark bye thanks